Look, what's always interesting to me is I've been recruiting security folks for like 16 years now, um, dating myself. And um, what's always interesting to me when you come to the conferences and there's so much technical discussion and there's so much uh, great content. I mean, um, attacks, um, new technologies, you see that all. Um, but as security pros, we spend a lot of time like working in our careers, and we don't really spend a lot of time working on our careers. And no matter how talented you are or um, you know, how bright you are, at some point in time, you're going to go to work for a living. And um, you're going to face yourself in a situation where you're interviewing for an opportunity um, that you probably, you're trying to figure out if you like it or not. You're trying to figure out, does this work for you? Does it not work for you? And no matter how many certifications or how much training that you have, nothing will really prepare you for those short moments in your life when you know, your performance and your connection and your interaction during those interview processes and those recruitment processes will truly have a bigger outcome than almost anything that you deal with career-wise. Be good talent. Um, so, you know, as professionals, we have uh, the laws of supply and demand on our side. Um, at the same point in time, that comes with a lot of burden um, because you have to make good decisions. And um, so a lot of times when we do panels and we have discussions about this, I really want to encourage more interaction with the group um, to ask questions, to maybe provide some of your own experiences um, so that the group can learn from each other, um, so you can um, have a better understanding of what others go through. Maybe you can learn from those experiences. Uh, we're very fortunate here to have uh, uh, two panelists from leading technology companies. Um, Linda Greco, um, raise your hand, Linda. <laughs> and she's a recruiter with uh, EMC and the RSA, the security division. And uh, Mark Knowlton, um, who's a senior recruiter um, over at Akamai. And um, I know through the presentation, they'll both Linda and Mark will have the ability to kind of tell you guys a little bit about what they're doing, some of the interesting things that are happening at their company. Um, but more importantly, they'll give you an insight to kind of how they look at talent, how they manage those processes, um, the things that they see that you don't see. Um, how do they deal with compensation? How do they deal with, um, you know, uh, the recruitment process from um, submission to closure? Um, so that you guys can actually get some real hardcore information about the things that you generally don't see. Um, so hopefully if you take something away from this presentation and source, this might be something that you can take away and put in your own back pocket and apply someplace down the road. So um, let me just let Linda and Mark introduce themselves. I think that's probably a good place to start. That's Mark. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Lee. Is, is this working? Um, no? Okay. Um, How about now? Oh, great. Okay, good. Eureka. Uh, thanks very much, Lee. Um, I've been with uh, Akamai just under two years, and um, I've been in the business uh, for 16 years, and I've seen um, you know, quite a, you know, quite a few uh, changes um, you know, in the in the marketplace, the talent is much more aware that they are very much in demand, but that can be a double-edged sword. I was when Lee was talking about the whole compensation thing. You know, a lot of times uh, a person's perception of what they're worth in the marketplace isn't a real reflection of what they're actually worth at a particular company. Um, and so, I'd love to be able to discuss in greater length what um, some of those challenges you, we might encounter. Um, but in terms of Akamai, we we look for, of course, really smart people, but not necessarily folks whose resumes look like an alphabet soup of acronyms. You know, so we'll discuss at greater length um, more about the kind of people we look for, and not necessarily someone who fits a parochial model. We just look for smart talent of people who think of their feet and like to be around smart people doing things that are really, really meaningful. When we push one third of all the traffic on the web in any given day. The stuff that we do matters to a lot of a lot of people, and so we like to find people who are passionate about doing something that has that big of an impact. 
and uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to talk later today. Um, uh, we have an open hour after this session, and uh, we're hosting a beer and wine reception later. So I'm more than open to have a more detailed conversation about some of the stuff we're doing. Hi, I'm Linda Greco. Nice to meet all of you. I've been with RSA since July. I've been with EMC for three years, and I've been a recruiter for over 20 years. Um, so that's a little bit about my background. I was a software engineer before I became a recruiter. So I talk techie, but I don't write techie. Um, so that's who I am. RSA, what can we say about RSA? Um, so overall EMC, 85 countries, over 60,000 employees making um, IT as a service, right? Storage, manage, protect, as well as analyze data for our clients. Um, we purchased RSA, how lucky and good fortune for us, in 2006. And RSA has grown to about 2,800 employees, 800 of which are headquartered here in Massachusetts, Bedford, Massachusetts. Um, so I'm sure you're familiar with RSA, but we're dealing with security risk and compliance. We're dealing with how we can use big data as a, as a solution to security. And I'm sure if you haven't had an opportunity to hear Art Coviello speak at the RSA conference, that was just a few months back in California, I highly recommend um, listening to that presentation. It's um, enlightening. RSA, absolutely, we're hiring. We're always hiring. We have currently today about 200 open positions, 100 of which are in our Bedford facility. We're in 60 countries, so um, we really do keep ourselves on the pulse of being a global security company. If you want to discuss anything with regard to position, opportunity, um, salary as well, a lot of times the one thing that people need to keep in mind is that they're always looking for a certain dollar value, and with that, you need to understand that you need to perform at that level. So understanding what your value is is very important, and also surrounding yourself with a level of intelligence um, where you can not only share information, but gain more information is also key to a successful growth professionally. Uh, so that's always something that you want to keep in mind, is who am I going to be working with? What kind of work am I going to be doing? What am I going to be able to contrib contribute? And will I be able to contribute at that value level but also, what are you going to continuously be learning? It's pretty comprehensive. We have two very esteemed companies here. And, um, you know, one of the nice things about being a security pro is that you get to pick from every one of them. And um, I guess one of the things that, you know, is probably, you know, in this competitive market, it would be a very good question to ask you guys. Um, how do you guys win? In other words, when you have a candidate walks in the door and they're looking at Veracode and Akamai and... EMC and Accenture or whomever it might be out there, right? How do you guys win? In other words, why should people come to work at, uh, because we've, all, we've just both said that, you know, don't ask for any money. But what we've said <laughs> is basically is that, but, but why should they come to work at your companies? Not so much, I, you know, not so much specifically about your company, um, but more so about why what do you think are good decision-making factors for people to consider when making a broad choice? Mark? Well, um, it's funny. A lot of times, because of our reputation of having this, this powerful global technology that can be an intimidating place to work, especially because there's so many smart people, but I was talking with you know, some of the InfoSec guys, and some of the things that attracted them was it's an environment where they're encouraged to ask questions and maybe admit that there's something that they don't know. And and the way the group looks at it is not to look down on someone who knows less than them. They are glad that they ask the question, fill the knowledge gap, and the person who's filling that gap feels, feels good about their contribution to the elevation of the team's you know, overall knowledge about Can I work. Can I interrupt you? Yeah. So you could probably say the same thing about a hundred different companies. In other words, but why, in other words, every company, right? And I'm going to now wear my yep. recruiting to the world hat, right? Mm -hmm. And we've represented like I don't know, 100, 150 of different types of technology vendors and that type of stuff along my tenure, right? Mm -hmm. But every internal recruiting function comes with the same story. We're best. We're going to be the biggest. We're going to win. We're going to dominate. Of course, they have to feel that way. So everybody, all these like esoteric things about like we're going to be more um, employee friendly. Um, 
how does how does somebody in the audience measure that? In other words, how do they measure that in the 30 minutes that they have of interviewing with somebody besides just trust me? Because they're going to trust you, Linda, just like they're trusting Mark. So in other words, you have a zero-sum transaction. So, Well, when you look at the scope of what we do, um, and given the fact that at any point in the day we're pushing one-third of all the traffic on the web, literally every person who logs in on the Internet is going to talk to us. Um, based on the fact that the, the amount of volume that we're caching on the web means we are literally keeping the internet from craving because of all the packets just flew freely from client, you know, peer to peer without any, you know, um, any uh, medium in the middle to, to keep all that traffic from flying. And we perform but, at a level that's just, you're not going to encounter in, in most and, of the And that's great, but everybody has a good widget. So in other words, like, when I'm trying, maybe Linda can help. Hi. Hi. Yeah, it's working. Um, so you're right. Every company has amazing things to offer. Certainly, um, certainly, certainly we do. And, and our reputation should precede you, which is what generated the interest as to why you wanted to come in for an interview with the company that you're interviewing for. But quite honestly, what feels right for you? That's what you want to determine. When you go in for an interview, what feels right for you? Learn about where have they come from, the person that you've interviewed. How have they professionally grown within the company? So you meet with Tom Heiser, and he's been with the company since 1984 as one of our first interns. How did he get that job? How? Because he went through a snowstorm when no one else showed up. He did something uniquely different that made him a standout, how he got hired. Now he's the president of the RSA company since 1984. It's the only job he's ever had. So what kind of promotional growth do you have? What kind of professional growth do you have as a working professional? Where is this company going to take you in the next two years, three years? So those are the things that you want to think about when you're interviewing. When you're meeting with these people, you spend more time with the people you work with than the people you love. You've got to love the people you work with. Love what you do and love the people that you're surrounded by. So know that you're, what you're going to learn from them. What are you going to contribute? It's just as much, it's a two-way interview process. What feels right for you? If it feels right for you, the job is right for you. Yeah, I, look, I think these are both very good points. I mean, I think that, you know, considering the company's business and considering, like, what works for you, like, and where that alignment is. Like, one of the things I'll tell people all the time is that you have to start thinking about the criteria of things that are important to you, and you have to start ranking them. And, you know, people change jobs or they accept jobs or go to workplaces for a whole slew of different reasons. And sometimes where somebody is in their life will dictate that. So I always tell people that you have to really truly be honest with yourself. Um, and you have to be able to pick environments that you can succeed in and things that align with where you are. Like um, I always say this is that I was willing to do more things work-wise when I was a 20-something and 30-something as opposed to now that I'm in my 40s um, just because my life's in a different place. Um, some people will commute more, some people will travel more, some people will work more hours. So the one thing I always tell people is that you have to think about the things that are core to you because like Linda said, is that you're going to be with this place, you know, not in security you're not going to be only there eight, 40 hours a week, that, that's just not realistic, but you're going to be in a place 45, 50 hours a week, you're going to have to enjoy what that is, and that's going to have to provide you with some sort of work-life balance that works for you, whatever that might be. Um, has anybody here like made a job decision recently, like a change? Tara? Let me ask you a question. Here's great. So I wouldn't even think about this. What do you guys think of job descriptions? Right? I mean, so, so here's this. Like, what goes into writing a job description? Because there's a lot of stuff on that paper, and it looks like, oh, God, I'm excellent. I can do this. I can do that. I can do that. And it's like, I can't even get an interview. So, like, what goes into, 
like your thought processes of writing job descriptions or helping the hiring managers write these job descriptions, and then B, what then makes the determination of why somebody goes, gets to interview, or versus why somebody doesn't get to interview? You want to take that, Mark? Sure, like, answer that from two perspectives. That I've been in a lot of places, both on the company side and the agency side, and the reality is that most companies Producing a job description is regarded as a painful rote exercise where copy and paste is the manager's best friend. And they just want to take a template that already exists and just slam it out. And the objective is to be done with the activity, not to write a precise, focused description of what that one job is going to be requiring. Quite, just hold it. I see a lot of people's heads nodding. Do you guys have to write jobs? How many people here have had to write a job description? Oh, good. We'll get back to you all. Go ahead. <laughs> and so, although it does take more time to craft something that's meaningful for that one particular position, I think that we do a disservice to both the candidates we're trying to attract and the positions we're trying to fill um, by just going through that hasty exercise of just repurposing something that already existed before, whereas um, the jobs often are uh, a, a a palette of buzzwords where if the candidate got the what's in it for me, why should I care, why do I want to go check this company out because a job description is a set of activities and buzzwords whereas you're accepting opportunity at a company so I think job descriptions that really speak to you are things that tell you why you want to go talk to this company because you're accepting the job an opportunity at a company, not just this job description. So let me just, and I'll get to you in a second. So let me just, so, so we, on one hand we've said that job descriptions are bullshit, and then we've had the other thing that says we should find a job description that responds to us. So how does somebody make sense of that? Who's we? Uh, I'm on the Akamai adversarial team. Akamai, okay. So we have a home, we have, we have triangulization here. Go ahead. one team at Akamai, so I can't speak for everyone. Okay, with the disclaimer is out. It's good. You won't get fired. If not, Linda will hire you, so don't worry about it. <laughs> here's, the way we've, uh, here's the way we've looked at it in the past. A job description is a program that has to be interpreted by two different interpreters simultaneously. It's a program that you're writing that simultaneously in HR recruiter code and candidate code. So you're passing it to HR as a filter on... You, you say HR with so much disdain. Linda was a software engineer. She'll kick your ass. Yeah, I've been on the other side of the fence. So I've greatest respect for what HR does. Um, really? <laughs> really? Like the cure. No, no, no. no let me finish that. Well, we could take them. Uh, what they're doing is looking at incoming resumes, and they're taking our job description as a filter on incoming resumes. Does this match the basic qualifications that we're looking for? But it's also a program that's being determined by the candidate. Do I have these qualifications? Do I have what it takes to succeed in this job? So if you make your if you're making your qualifications too tight, people might not apply, and the incoming resumes that might you might otherwise want uh, are going to get filtered by HR. On the other hand, if you make it too loose, you get a lot of people who are applying for the job who are frankly not qualified for it. So it's a difficult... Uh, it's Holy a difficult conundrums, process. Batman. <laughs> ...has been simply to go to the HR team that's doing the recruiting, give them the resumes from the people who are on the team right now, and say, does this match the net that you're going to cast right now? And if not, maybe we need a little bit wider. I'll accept that to resume. I'll take a look at extra resumes, the ones that I can go throughout myself, simply because... Very few people come from straight and narrow path to information security. Everybody comes through different ways. We've got one biologist, we've got a chemical engineer, 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 we've got a chemical uh, attractive. So what do you do? You have the overall general, then you have specific information about why your particular
particular group is so cool. And then you might have some general information about why your location is so cool, whether it's specific to living in the Boston area, of course, amazingly cool, or um, specific to your site and location and what, what um, facilities that you have available to your employees. And then it's the key, really the job description, right? What are you looking for? What do you want that person to do? And what are some crucial skills that you're looking for? So when I speak with managers, I say, really, what do you want this person to do? What is key that you're looking for? So from an applicant standpoint, very often when we're seeking out resumes and we're looking at candidates' profiles, we're seeing what's directly transferable. And I find that more often than not when you're dealing with resumes, they might be a little bit too generic and not really specifically oriented towards the task or position that they're looking to apply for. So that really you should have more than one version and your resume should be oriented towards that one job description and how you're going to make a difference. So, it shouldn't be me, me, me. It's so, what can I give you. So what Linda's saying is that we should social engineer the interview process. Because if that's what's happening is that, so, because the, the thing that's interesting, I, I, the one thing that I picked up on, and I'll, I'll get to you for a second, the one thing I picked up on that I find very interesting is that it's this reliance on the resume. All of a sudden, instead of being information security professionals, now when we put on our hiring hat, we're professional resume interpreters. Now, is that really possible? Because that would almost be like you telling me to go hack something. Because that's illogical. Like, what I've learned over the course of time is that, you know, people have 8 million different opinions on how to put together a resume. And if the entire goal of an interview process is to get through the gatekeeper, then the best answer possible is to write new resumes for every job description because you will tailor everything to get through the gatekeeper to have your day in the sun. Go ahead, Linda. Um, but the, the, what, you're, what you're saying is that it's only through resume applications. What, what we're not adding to it are going to events like this where you're allowed to give yourself an opportunity to become that multi-dimensional person, not that two-dimensional resume. So there's your opportunity to introduce yourself to let the company know why you are so amazing and why we need to hire you so that we can say, hey, I just met this person and you need to interview that person. That has nothing to do with your resume. That has everything to do with who you are as an individual. Which I completely agree with, but you know what? How many hours does everybody work here a week? I mean, in count commute too. Are we, how many people work more than 40 hours a week? How many people work more than 50 hours a week? How many people work around 60 hours a week or more? So between 50 hours a week, right, then you want them to come out on their free time to interact with people with the sense of hoping to find interaction. I'm saying capitalize on all of your opportunities. So there's, there's, there's social media, there's LinkedIn concepts, there's ways to introduce yourself to individuals that aren't just... There are all those drunk photos on that Facebook page. Yeah, I don't know. But LinkedIn I do use on a regular basis. And you would be surprised at how often I receive information from executives, management, um, consulting, all different avenues of our company that says, Linda, I met this person on LinkedIn. Maybe we can utilize this person. Can you take a look? So it's a business tool that you should take advantage of and use, and a lot of times people don't use that. So one avenue of sending a resume, if that's what you're putting your hopes and dreams on, then, then you're limiting yourself. So if you're aggressively out there seeking a new position, then you should use the multiple avenues that are available. So that's a good question for both of you. How do you guys look at LinkedIn versus resumes? Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, I received an email this morning from a uh, candidate who's graduating uh, from Northeast with his master's, found me and sent me an email, and it just so happens I am looking to fill an entry-level uh, job developer position, and I got back to him and said, okay, I'll, I'll call you. I'm a little busy this week, but I will call you. Um, I have hired people out of technical user groups that we host. Um, now, again, as we mentioned, it does take time. I mean, after you work your 50 hours, you're left with 118 for the rest of the do everything that's pretty, else. That's pretty good math. <laughs> but I, here, here's, here, and I'll let you train your th train of thought, but here, here's the interesting thing. Most of these people don't want the job that they already have. 
if they're like the lead engineer, they want to be the manager. If they're the manager, they want to be the director. If they're the director, they want to be the vice president. If they're the vice president, they want to be the CSO. If the CSO, they want to run the company. So getting using your resume and your LinkedIn to get the job that you already have, I see as a very easy thing. My question to you is that since these people aren't generally actively seeking employment, mm -hmm. they might be actively seeking better employment or better opportunity or more money. How does a person convey that? Not the kid who's just graduating saying, oh shit, I got $100,000 worth of debt, I got to pay this off somehow. But the person that says, look, you know what? I'm kicking ass where I am. The person above me is a little bit better than me. I'll be honest. I'm the, just maybe got passed over for something. How do I get, you know, how am I as an assistant coach become the head coach of some other company? Well, when we say use LinkedIn, there's many different ways to use LinkedIn. And this kid happened to go directly, you know, to me. But the, the way you do something like that, especially is if, let's say, you're a principal level person, you want to get your first manager, you would find somebody who has a job like who's, who has a job like that, and then get an introduction from somebody who's in your network connected to that individual. That way, you inherit the credibility of the person saying, "Hey, I know this guy hasn't done management before. He's ready to step up. He's worth the conversation." And so you can leverage social network, but also the influence of others in your network. So you don't have to just go and make a cold contact yourself, which is not a comfortable thing for most people who use you know, technology to make a living. But that's something I strongly encourage because how many times have you ever gotten an interview for somebody by just handing a resume to someone who trusted your opinion? I say forget resumes. I just say forget them. I mean, I because quite frankly, um, I mean, yeah, it's the currency, but it's, um, you know, you're hearing from folks here who do this for a living that the resume is really kind of like, you know, an after the fact. It's like a small component to the puzzle. And they, they're basically saying that you need to focus on other avenues in doing that and other ways of, quote unquote, marketing yourself. Um, I, I, I still, I guess. Here's just a question forgetting about the, um, and just feeding off this. Um, if somebody was to come in as a quote unquote principal engineer and they apply to a manager job in one year, I, whatever the title is, I don't care about the title, but they're applying for one step up and they've never done that before. What it, could you tell them what the likelihood of them getting their first promotion through? Uh, you know, a blind resume or a response to a job posting? Almost zero. Almost zero. Uh, because through the conventional, when you apply to jobs at, all right, it's going to be in a stack of other resumes, qualified, unqualified, and everything in between. And the amount of time it takes to read through every individual resume is daunting. And when you have somebody who doesn't look like their resume is used to write the job description, you, but you're trying to go up a level, it's almost impossible to do it by just going in and applying directly. How do you guys feel about that? Yeah, yeah I want to add, um, I think time has certainly changed. Uh, big time is that the effectiveness, the effectiveness of a resume has really worn off because especially in this business, um, a lot of people have, you know, it's almost like a dime and a dozen. First of all, a resume is a dime and a dozen. But the second thing is, it does not tell the whole story, especially if you're in this business where what you have, what you can do, your hands-on skill, is definitely something that you, you know, it, it's not going to be shown on a resume. So I think to turn that around, um, it would be to say, you know, what makes you feel that you would be a good manager? You're, an, you're a principal level person. What have you done from a learning standpoint? What additional courses, what motivations have you taken in your own accord that puts you that would make you qualified for a management role did you go for your MBA did you mentor a new grad that came on board and started showing leadership skills although you weren't compensated for them but just to gain that working knowledge so that you can actually apply it at a larger scale somewhere else so the the key is is maybe you don't have the title but you've done the job that's does that make sense see that? so that gives you more relevance I want someone who's led a team of three people who knows how to get it done who can work with multicultural environments who work with uh, different scenarios whatever that is have you done that yet have you done that within your own company have you taken the initiative to say we have a new guy coming on board 
let me put him under my wing, I'll teach him. So that you start gaining the skills that's required in order to do that job on a competent level. So that, uh, that's an interesting point because I think that partially what Linda is telling you is that if you're working internally in a company, and stop me if I'm misinterpreting, if you're working internally in the company, if you want it to be promoted and you want it to move up levels, what you truly need to do is you need to find opportunities within the walls of your company to absorb that responsibility so that you can showcase your talents to somebody or people who matter. And then when that promotion comes up or that opportunity comes up, instead of saying, let's go outside and post the position, they say, look, you know what? Susan's done a great job over here before. She's really doing the job. I know she's interested in becoming a manager. We should interview her first because she's invested time in our company and got there. Am I good there? Okay. Now, the trick of that is, right? So what, is that, what that really is saying is that in order to continue to progress your career upward, if that's the direction you want to head, you have to look inwardly to your company to be able to build those skills. So when it's time for you to look externally, instead of saying, well, I led this team of three people and I did this and I did that, but you weren't a manager. Did you really manage people or did you just lead them? Because on the outside, if you were coming in, your resume, as Mark said, would get lost if you weren't a manager. But because you're able to achieve that title or whatever, those responsibilities of manager, now when you apply, you are now not a principal, you are a manager. And that person might get some consideration. Is that fair? Do you guys, get, do you guys see where that comes? Because many people come call my office and they're calling us up about, I'm ready for the next step in my career. And the truth is, is that people aren't going to promote people that they don't know. They're not going to, because people aren't going to roll the dice on their own careers by making crappy hiring decisions. Because it's too, that's how they got to be managers. All right. Rob and then Carol. We actually had a most recent hire was a student coming right out of college because he went up and introduced himself to uh, Tom Heiser at a, at a at a speech that he was given. Was Tom it through a snowstorm? It wasn't through a okay. snowstorm that time, but I'll tell you, it's because that person did something uniquely different. So think to yourself, what are you doing uniquely different that's making you a standout? Um, I, within our company, we ha all of our employees have opportunities to have mentors. And your mentor typically is not within your group, but within another group within the company where you sit and you work on your professional growth and career within EMC, within, uh, within yourself, within RSA. Um, we also have uh, situations where movement within the company is, is encouraged. Happens all the time. We were just talking about a, a co-worker of ours, a, a friend of his and, and a co-worker of mine. She was with RSA. Now she's moved into a higher level position within EMC. Um, and that's always considered um, a good thing. So it, you really have to think about what opportunities are there before you. What are you doing to get educated? What are you doing to connect with others who have the job that you want? Carol?
every big company. Okay, let's let's for not forget big. But they don't have systems at a small company. That's a big deal. They have systems at and 25, then I think that that's a very appropriate statement. But I'm thinking that this room is more of a, you know, anywhere between five and 20 years in their careers. So like, all those things are really great. Like, you know, if, um, you know, you know, you have a kid graduating college, but like, chances are, um, you know, when you start dealing at, at these levels, um, when you start people have, like, actually have a career as a security professional, you're dealing with much different criteria. And you're dealing with, um, you know, m a whole slew of different variables. Um, you know, one point that was just brought up in this was um, the concept of differentiation. Um, I think Linda brought it up, but, you know, in most scenarios, any good job, like in searches that I get called on, like when we do a CISO, they don't just say, well, send me one person. They don't do that. You know, they say, like, well, we might start with a field of, like, say, 30. Like, we just did the CISO search at Mayo Clinic, right? Pretty big job. We, had, we started with a field of about 30, and we narrowed it down, and we narrowed it down, and we narrowed it down, and then, you know, we find exactly what they want. But that's a big short. The thing is this, is that the last, the, the five final candidates for that job were all winners. They just picked the one that was the best winner for them. So one of the things that, you know, maybe I'll throw it out to the room and then I'll give it back to the panel, but what are the things that you guys think will differentiate yourself? Because there's a, a huge difference between being Miss America and Miss Congeniality um, in the employment game. So any thoughts on that? Any thoughts on how you differentiate yourselves from your peers? Carol? What's your policy on Columbus Day? <laughs> huh? The job interview itself 
it's just a confirmation of what people already know about each other. I think another piece to that, um, thank you. Another piece to that would be um, your ability to think. Um, so more often than not, I'm seeing that when um, people are working with their managers, especially on the technical end, are looking to see because paper says so much about you and sometimes people elaborate um, and some are, are don't say enough so very often when you're going through the interviewing process and you're interviewing for a technical position they're going to give you a problem that they want to watch you solve and you may not solve it in the interview time that that you have so you need to be prepared they want to see how you think how you deduce how you uh, deduce information how you break it down What's the process by which you're coming to your conclusion? Long division. Showing your long division. It's all on a whiteboard, and um, and that's what they're learning. So make sure that the information that you have on your profile is actually true, and then you can back it up. Because especially for a technical role, they're going to test you on that, and you should be prepared for that. <laughs> to dovetail on what Linda just said, um, a lot of times people have the. Do you have a question? No, I got, I got it, Max. Oh, okay. Um, they wanted to uh, include all the different technologies to which they've been exposed, but there are some times that can really bite you in the backside when uh, when someone puts it on the resume, they say, okay, this is fair game, I'm going to drill down the phone on this one, you better be ready. So be careful of what you put on your resume unless you're prepared to talk about it in detail. Yeah, I want to add something to that, Mark, yep. and it really bothers me when people put an alphabet not certification but technology like right. iOS and Android because there's an old saying that it's much better to have one really really sharp knife than to have a bunch of knives that are just not sharp right and that, that becomes dangerous that, ah you see there's the problem right we have one example and we have four or five different perspectives so how the hell can you figure it out it's impossible because you can't please everybody so hold on a second Gentleman in the blue sweater. Yes. Um, back to the cases. <laughs> we all care about benefits of the cases. So when is the time for that? Okay, good. I said earlier about, about um, different points that where we are in our careers. You know, if you're not going to be a developer, you've been working for 10 or 15 years. So all that stuff is very relevant, mm -hmm. right? So, so when is the time for that? Well, um, I would focus on that when it seems more apparent that there's a good fit for both sides. You know, everyone gets a good sense after one interview of whether or not there was a real connection. Okay, because if you're bombing the technical interview, how many weeks vacation they offer is rather moot, right? Even the compensation. I mean, obviously you want to make sure there isn't a huge disconnect that you find out at the end. But don't worry about the benefits until it appears there's a fairly good probability that there's going to be an offer to discussion uh, to happen. I'm going to interrupt one question, one thing. Yep. If something to you is a deal breaker, at any point in time, you should raise that at a point where your time investment is going to become worth it. So, like I'll give you an example. This is completely off the cuff. I have a client, for anonymity, it's a in New York City. Anyhow, um, we're, they're hiring somebody in a place completely outside of where they're normally operating. Their benefits program um, doesn't provide great coverage for um, this part of the country where they are. It's a boutique -y type of a place. Um, the candidate set up front and said, look, I have a child, has some, some very unique medical needs, I need specific insurance, and if the company doesn't have that insurance, we shouldn't even start the process. And you know what? That was like a very valid thing. And you do a little due diligence up front with that, and you get that taken care of. Um, I'll give you a complete flip, right? Something completely different. Candidate wants with a drunk driving arrest. Perfect model citizen except for this one transgression. She said to me, she said, look, before we go in, I want you to know that if they run a background check, they're going to find this on my background, and I want to be upfront about it. It's a big thing. I'm not proud of it. I'll talk about it, and but I want to let that out there. So by clearing some of those hurdles at somewhat of an early stage, maybe after the first date, maybe after you've had a phone conversation, 
that's probably a good time. Because a phone conversation is not that big of an investment. People aren't really clearing their calendars too much. But as soon as you're starting to take days off of work and other people are really allocating their time to evaluate you, I think that if something is that important to you, commute, work from home, I mean, whatever you know who you are as a person, as long as you're willing to accept that as a deal breaker and know that the employer can stop the process based upon what you've articulated, you know, that's good. The worst thing is to spring that on them at the end of the process. That's the worst. At some point you should, excuse me, at some point you should be speaking to an HR rep. So my, my response to that would also be know your audience. So that question with regard to benefits, all benefits, and you can ask that question of where can I, or if you haven't done it already, you might be able to find their benefits information online without even having to ask that question. So that would be your first point of research that I would recommend that you do. But once it comes to the point where it looks like this is going to be a longer term relationship, not a quick date, um, that's when you want to make sure that you say, you know, when you speak to a human resources, know who you're speaking with, know who you're interviewing with, and say, can you give me information regarding your general, ben your overall gen benefits package? She will give you that, or he will give you that information in a general scope, where you can then say, oh, that's interesting. Um, is this something that's a part of the negotiation? Let's say there's three weeks, you're looking for four weeks, you already currently have whatever. So the time for that is with your human resources rep versus your manager who's dealing, who's interviewing you for a different set of skills. And you can ask open-ended general questions that might include the answer that you're looking for. It, it's, it's generally easy to get something that you already have if it's not that far of a departure. Like if you have three weeks they offer two, you can generally get three. If you have five weeks they offer two, you might get three, you're never getting five. Just back on resumes for a moment. Um, you mentioned making sure you have all the relevant technologies, but not too many technologies. It, it's batshit crazy. You can't figure that out. Well, the thing is, I think anyone in here who's applied for a job has like SEO section of the resume. It's a shameless, oh God, I apologize. <laughs> but I'm really good at my stuff word, you know, like yeah. It would suck to get passed over for a job because I didn't clarify that I can deal with my technology. You know, and that's something that let me ask you a question. You really want that job? I mean, yeah. I mean, you really want yeah. that job? Yeah. Kind of that, that would never be a uh, no, it's, knockout. It's, it's, it's batshit crazy. I mean, I, there's no answer to your question. It's an infinite loop. Sure. A more relevant one, though, is like, see, the answer is P, yes or no. And that becomes a checklist book over, and you miss out a lot of good candidates. Look. That's a whole nother session. So, <laughs> go ahead. I, we, we only have like, I, we have like spillover time for more questions. So the session ends at 3.30. So maybe they'll stop recording, but I know that we'll stay as long. I mean, it's designed this way. So, you know, feel free to get up and leave. But feel free to stay and answer any questions that you want to. But. Excellent question. Um, I deal with students, a tremendous amount of students. I, I, um, I manage the co-op and internship program for uh, RSA and another division, our unified storage division. Um, I do not screen out Facebook. However, I'm, uh, people do. It happens. Whether whether it's for us, I, that's I, that's not relevant to me in terms of what your. I want to look at your business LinkedIn. I absolutely will look at that, but I will not look at your Facebook. Um, you should Google yourself. You should check your Facebook. And if it's not something that you don't want your grandparent, your preacher, your neighbor, or your children to see, my recommendation is take it off. The internet um, is the internet, and there's full disclosure out there, and it's very easy to get a lot of information on you. But you should absolutely make sure that what you're putting on there is something that you would be proud of. So be prepared to clean that up. And I, I actually give an information session on students as to some of the things that they should really make sure is clean. So following up on the get the promotion before you make the move, just as we had earlier, um, I've actually been kind of in a, in a trap for the last five years. Oh, that's right? a long time. Wow, that so must be some powerful trap. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what happens is I've, I've, I've made some moves, and especially 
have grown a lot. And every time I do an interview, someone says, you know what, you really need to be running a team now. Less of the direct technical skills, more of the team management. Well, that's great, except that every time I make a move, I watch and I wait, and it's just not happening. So here's the key words that you said, I watch and I wait. Why? Why are you not doing and asking? So my recommendation to you would be the first thing is go to your manager and say, this is something that I want to build on on my personal skills or it's my professional goal. And part of your professional goal and con conversations that you have with regard to your review and how you grow as an employee and as a professional is having that personal professional growth in your profile. So working with your manager and saying, I really want to have an opportunity to try and start leading other employees. How do we make this happen? Do you and work, work with your manager on doing that. Do you work at a corporate um, like security program and you're like a team of one, is that it? No, I, I work on a product development. Okay. Company. And you have... So we consult various projects. I got you. So you're like a shared services. You're the security resource. You overlay. And it's, when you say we, is it you and... Well, I, or you are the we? And, and I bid, so I, I have people who fulfill the services that I bid for, but they're not my Ah, so in other words, like you have to lead by leverage and influence. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's an inter that's I mean that's an organizational structure scenario. Like one of the things I would make the suggestion is that maybe you can ask, you know, maybe what you can do is to try to figure out a way to maybe get into the business of in other words, instead of being the deliverer, being the purchaser. Does that make sense? Where in other words, instead of being it might be a different role, it might be a non, it might be where security becomes a portion of the role, but then the leadership and the management of the group, like you might have to kind of move laterally within that organization to do that, because you just don't have structurally in your organization, it's not set up for you to have direct reports, and you need an organizational seismic shift to actually have that opportunity even become made available. Does, does that make sense? It, it does. I worry a little bit because if I do that, then I have a lot less leverage to draw from and tell you. Oh, I'm not saying it's good. I'm just saying is that if that's what you want to do, you know, if you ask like how you would go and solve that problem. See, the thing is this. If you go and try that and it doesn't work, your skills aren't going to miraculously leave your body. In other words, your skills have value beyond the walls of your current company. It's like, it's like a base, I, I like to use baseball analogies. It's like a baseball player who's playing in AAA. They're not just trying out for the Red Sox. They're trying out for all 30 Major League Baseball teams because they can, they're, they're an asset and they can be traded. So you, you, know, you have market value beyond the walls of your company. You know, the market is not just your company. Your company becomes the market that is your market today. But the market for somebody's skills is the entire competitive matrix. So if you're not getting it where you are, you know, there are certain ways that you can do to communicate to your boss about things that are important to you because I'm sure they value you as a resource if they kept you in this prison for five years. So they're not just letting you go, right? So think about it in some of their terms. Ah, what do you want to know? <laughs> How do I do it? Yeah, no, so why, so why don't they tell you? That's a great, that's a great question. Okay, so most established companies uh, come up with salary structure, salary grades from a different couple of perspectives. They use external market data whereby they subscribe to services where everyone self-reports. We pay these um, people doing this job at this industry level you know, in this company uh, sector, at this size, in this geography and they come up with averages, you know, low, median, and high. Okay, and then they look at internal equity, which is like, uh, who do we have on our team right now, who's at this level, and what are we paying them, and what is this candidate most closely a comparison to? Um, now, the dynamic here is that the market can change, and you have someone who accepted a job eight years ago and is still there, is an internal equity drag on new people coming in. That's going to exist at any place that has long-term constituencies. But for the most part, a company is going to try to offer you a salary that's in line with both the internal equity and the external market data. There's always going to be outliers, but what the thing I've seen most consistently is people go do their research. They go on 
you know, salary.com and Glassdoor, and they talk to their friend. Yeah, that's all the salary door and the glass. I mean, that's you have to really take that stuff. Like all those web-based salary stuff is completely, in my mind, is not applicable to any one individual. Um, I, you know, uh, organizations. Um, I like like a big organization like EMC or Akamai. They pay a lot of money to third-party firms that assess market data, just like a Gartner would do a magic quadrant, where they start designing compensation ranges. Stop me if I'm wrong. That there becomes like a, a low point, a high point, and a midpoint. Mm -hmm. When these companies hire, stop me anytime, they like to hire people basically at or around the midpoint, give it like anywhere between 2 and 5%. So exactly right. some of the things that they will do, now, you know, there are certain things that will factor that. Obviously, their internal equity and the people that they currently have. That's how they get those numbers. But they also might think about how big the problem that they have. Um, you might have to be one of four or five people that they're seeing that are in the same price range. So their market data might lag, but they'd have to get more of the general consensus of like what is the true market for this particular skill that I've outlined in my job description that all my people like. And then what happens is this, is that you might get a group of candidates that might be three or four for a very hard to find position. And then what they'll do, another baseball example, is that they're going to money ball it. And what they're going to do is they're going to say, I can have the best candidate that solves my problem that will have to pay them X. Or I can have somebody that has some growth and we're going to have to take a little bit of a gamble and we could pay them X minus 20 and it might be at the midpoint. Or they might decide to take something in the middle that they can really kind of agree to and start charting candidates that way. Is, is that kind of how it goes down? Yep. I also want to see, it depends on the value added that you're bringing, right? So always think about, I want more money, I want more money. You want to think, this is the value I bring that justifies the cost increase. So when you're going through salary negotiation, you should really know the skill set that you offer, how much it's in demand. If they're interviewing five people just like you, you're less likely to have negotiating room. They'll just say, thank you so much for the time and interview, and we'll just hire the second guy. Um, and that happens. So you, it's a delicate balance, and always remember that the value that you bring is what your dollar value should, dollar value should equate to. So it's the skill set level that you're bringing and how the value that we need it. Why is it in our best interest as a company I'm to gonna, hire you? I'm going to jump on that for a second, right? Because quite frankly, I think candidates have a lot more leverage than they give themselves credit for. I, I, there's nobody coming into the room after this. So we're good till people leave. Anybody wants to leave, leave. You could have left anyway. But um, so the thing is this: is that you as a candidate have leverage, but you have leverage if you can justify and support it. Also, you as an employee have leverage too. Now, one of the best things like people always say is that like they'll say like. Well, I'm going to see if I get a counter offer, or I'm going to see if, uh, you know, I'm going to go take this offer and give it to my employee and, and, and my employer, and then they're going to pay me more money because they're going to see what, you know, they're going to be, you know, your behavior and how you handle that process is probably more important. If you really want to see what's out there in the market, the only way you could truly see how your skills are valued is this. You either have a peer group of people who are kind of like in your position at like companies in the same geography that you can speak openly with about compensation. The other thing that you can do is you can actually go out there and interview for things that, not for the next job, but interview for your current job. Interview for the job that you have just at different companies. So if you're at... Uh, um, I'll use New York because it's easy for me. But if you're at Goldman Sachs, go out and interview at uh, Morgan Stanley, interview at a couple hedge funds, interview at Citigroup. Go out and you'll get the market segment of what your skill works for in those environments. At that point in time, you could say, look, you know, 
give your next salary review with your boss and say, look, I just want you to know, as I'm not looking, but I got offered, I got, I've been called from recruiters left and right for these types of roles. They're the exact role that I'm doing. This is what these jobs are paying out in the market. I like working here. I'm not telling you I'm going to go, but I'm just letting you know I'm doing your market intelligence for you. And I'd like for you guys to consider this when you have my next, uh, my next raise. So it's an indirectly telling them, hey, look, I'm not holding a gun to your head, but I'm willing to. So it's basically creating that open relationship with your man. Because in a perfect world, you don't want to leave. And in a perfect world, your manager doesn't want to lose you. So most people look at that and say, wow, what is my manager going to think if I do this? They're not going to like me. They're going to hate me. No. They're going to respect you. They're going to respect you because you're doing it professionally. You're not putting them in a bad situation where you back them into a corner. Because if you back them into the corner, they're going to tell you to leave. I don't care how valuable you are, yeah. but they're going to find that other person who's pushing for your opportunity and say, look, you know what? We have four other people who want to do your job. You want to go work at Citigroup? Go right to hell and do it. That's what they're going to do. So The other piece to that is be very leery of a situation where they're going to pay you way beyond what your value is. That's good So point. what is the company's situation that they're willing to go so high for your skill set? Are they having attrition problems? Are they having... Are they losing customers? Really know the company that you're interviewing for. And if you see that you're receiving an offer that's way beyond the scope of what may seem too good to be true, it just might be too good to be true. Make sure you understand the culture and the environment and uh, that it's the right place for you to go beyond just the, the money. That's just something that you should always keep in mind. If you're in it just for the money, then sales is definitely where you should well, be. If, but if you're, <laughs> in it, well, if you're in it just for the money, go work as a 1099. Yeah, be a consultant. I mean, be a consultant. Those guys, they have no career path. They have to invest in themselves, and there's nothing wrong with it. But that's, you will make more money. You will live with more indecision. But you know what, though? You'll own your own time, and you'll be responsible for your own negotiation. And to dovetail on what Linda said, and this, um, the counter, when the counteroffer thing came up, <clears throat> the counteroffer is like career suicide. I mean, I've seen a number of stats. Roughly 83% of people who accept counteroffers are not there six months later. Okay, so if you want to finesse your way into getting more money by going out and get a counteroffer, it's just like Lee said, you are putting a gun barrel to the, your boss's head, and they're not going to appreciate that very much. All right. Neither will the company that you interviewed with are wasting their time. Right. Carol? So, Mm -hmm. No, well, look, so I'm going to take a little bit of a different path and just offer a contrarian opinion on the concept of counteroffer, right? I don't like it either in my business, and um, I, there's probably nothing that I, I guess probably would bother me more because you kind of feel that you're not getting a full story when you're interacting with somebody. But I never fault somebody for considering taking counteroffers because I don't know their current work environment and they know their current work environment. And they have that relationship with their boss. Um, and at the end of the day, changing jobs is not a, um, it's an emotional decision as well. Um, I don't think that you can have like a long, like a really good long-term trajectory in in, in success in a current company if you're always looking for counter opportunities. But, um, you know, I think that the problem happens is that as people start to look, they don't give their employee left the job for a manager. You basically set up the smoke signals and the flags and say that. Now, if you walked in their office one day and said, look, you know what, I got this opportunity. I'm going to be in the final stages of an interview for a manager role. And you say, hey, you know, I don't know your name, but hey, Hiram. Hey, Hiram, um, you know, look, um, it 
that's what's going to take for you to stay, then we'll figure that out. Now, you then have to evaluate, are they moving, are they doing that for you? Or for, now, that's a completely different story. But that's really up for you to assess. So to give a blanket statement, you know, because, I mean, quite frankly, in our business, in our, what we do, like, that's the worst to think that, you know, something's going to happen and you've built this internal trust with this person and people have been, you know, expecting somebody to come and then they don't leave because of a counteroffer or because they decide to stay or they go take some other job. You know, it's your career. You make the decisions, you reap the benefits, you suffer the consequences. So it's a huge responsibility. It's not any internal recruiter's responsibility. It's not an external recruiter's responsibility. It's not a hiring manager's responsibility. It's your own responsibility to manage your career. And one day or another, you will pay or you will benefit for how you act and how you behave during this facet of your career. So I just want you to all think about that is that you know you you owe that to you know, your responsibilities sit with your families they sit with the people who truly care about you and that could include your manager um, but that's really where that sits so go ahead I, I've heard a couple conflicting uh, ideas here good where it's, it's that's the said, thinking right? well it's, it's been said go out and see what the market's like go interview at places yeah. But then don't waste the, the future employer's time. Where do you find that balance between not wasting where you're interviewing, wasting their time, versus testing the waters or testing the waters? Let me ask you a question. Are you married? Okay. Before I got married, I'll make it so it's not painful, right? <laughs> I dated different women before I decided to get married. I actually even got married once and decided that wasn't good, and then I dated other women before I got married again. So was all that dating a waste of time? No, because it helped me get to a point where I was able to make a decision. Now, were people hurt along the way? Me, them, of course. But that's the same thing about it. There is an opportunity cost. And they accept it, and you accept it. Just like you can interview for something, they can say, wow, we want to hire you. You can say it's not the right place. You could go interview and say, like, I really want to work there. And they can say, we're not hiring you. So. Everybody understands the rules of the game beforehand. Just set your parameters so you know that if things did come down to the right scenario, you'd be in a place to say, like, this could work. You know, you don't want to interview for jobs that um, require 50% travel if you're not willing to travel. That's a waste of time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, to, to add to that, um, very often, when approaching a candidate who's not actually on the market, just say right up front, like, well, this is kind of an exploratory. And you set that up with the person who's going to be speaking to the candidate just to probe if there's more interest and, you know, get to the point where you are going to start getting a commitment from other people. So, you know, I'm just kind of kicking the tires. I'm, I'm not ready to make a move, but I'm ready to listen. And if, as long as you're okay with this being an exploratory and I might walk away, then I'm good with, you know, with, with, with your participation in that. So as long as you put the cards on the table face up, there's no surprises for anybody. But here's a good rule for you all. You should all be always in the exploratory phase. There's, there's, there's zero, I mean like, and, and I'm not saying that, you know, you should, interviewing should be a sport, but like if you have like a certain amount of vacation days, you should act, you should utilize, say look, I'm gonna, probably allocate every year three or four days to interviewing or whatever that number that works for you. Um, just because, quite frankly, is that you have to understand what's happening around you. And the only person that could really appreciate that perspective is yourself. Um, like, you know, look, um, everybody has their own time. And, you know, the interview process is very much um, set up where you know, you're going to dress up real nice, they're going to dress up real nice, and you're going to figure out if, you know, we like each other. Um, the only thing I say this is that if you decide to do that, be sincere about engaging. Don't be like, yeah, you know, I got a call, and I figured I'd just show up and see what you guys are doing, right? That's bad. 
Um, so like, do your homework. Understand the position. Know what you're talking about. Um, make sure that that's... Um, make sure that you give it the respect that the people on the other side are giving it. Um, and I think that's fair. Do do scenario. Play hard. Oh, I have a response for you on that. So I have a little story for you that I'll share. High executive, hands involved in many different things, finally decides it's time, I'm done, I'm going to retire. Now this was a very important person within the company, had a tremendous amount of responsibility and really was involved in multiple projects. And he gave a one month notice before he retired. In one week's time, his phone stopped ringing. Everyone is replaceable. So if you do your job well, and you have a deadline of three months, and you want to see that project through because it's important to you, and it's, based, it, it's for you, you want to see the project to completion. That's a personal decision. If it's a situation where you're thinking the company will fall without me, that's not true. It's just simply not true. I, I, I don't so, think he's saying that, though. So when you, if I, I think you're missing. What he's saying is this: is saying that if he gets approached by a company mm -hmm. and he's like let's take it and, he, start and he's not in other words like he's in the no. middle of doing something that's really cool he doesn't want to leave now but like in three months he'd really love to explore this how does he handle that situation i think honesty is always the best policy it's always say i'm jazzed about your company i think you're doing some incredible work i'm in the middle of a project right now where it will be complete july 1st i'd love to come in and have a conversation with you now in the opportunity that that would be an op a good opportunity for us to work with one another. The process itself could take the same amount of time as it takes for you to complete your project. It's a good answer. A couple years? A couple uh, years, that's, 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 that's like, I mean, a that's couple years. I mean, a couple years, the person's probably not going to be there in a couple years. I mean, a couple years, I mean. It's like saying, do you want to get married on your first date? See, it always comes back to dating. <laughs> it always comes back to dating. Really but no, like a couple of years is like, it's, that's like, I mean, I, I don't even know how to, like, like, you can't really, like, you have to understand is that recruiting, it's, the thing that's in recruiting is this. The company has an itch and it needs to be scratched. You happen to be the back scratcher. In the most, I mean, that's really what it comes down to, right? Um, people hire because of need. Mm -hmm. Candidates get opportunity because of want. Successful recruiting is really the interaction of need and want. The candidate gets something that they want, the employer gets something that they need, and we agree to some sort of compensation for it, and that works. Um, we have five minutes left. I want to hit the compensation thing one more time, right? Um, all I tell people is this, is that, you know, one of the biggest questions when we engage a candidate with any of our clients, and I'm sure that they have the same practices at Akamai and um, EMC, is that we ask the candidate, well, what are you currently earning? And sometimes candidates are a little bit nervous about, like, why should I answer that question? Why is that important? And the thing I always tell people is this, is that, I never want to send a candidate into an opportunity where we can't afford to pay them. And the negotiation process, I think when you work with internal recruitment or external recruitment, begins at the presentation and the consent of saying, I'd like to interview for a job. Because what we do is that we start benchmarking and baselining compensation to, to know that if the hiring people want to end the process, that we're going to get to a certain point. Um, I'll give you a great example of something that just really happened. It's true life, right? I have a client in New York. I have clients outside of New York, but it just seems a lot of New York right now. But um, I have a client in New York. Um, it was like a very senior technical security software architecture type, job, type candidate. The 
candidate says, look, I'm earning about 200000 now. I like my job. I like being here. It would only be meaningful for me to take this job at $300,000 total comp. I said, okay, fine. We, said, we send the candidate in. This is the ground rule. The candidate goes through the interview process. He does well. Not great, but well. Best candidate that they've seen thus far. At the end of the process, they say to us, they're like, you know what? We can afford to pay the 300, but based upon the other people that were interviewed, that we have in our company, we'd hire them no brainer at 260, 270, just not at three. Do you think the candidate would be interested? And then I said to the client, I said, the answer to that question is no. I'll ask the candidate once because out of courtesy, because you've all invested the time, but you guys understood the price point for the candidate. They made it very clear. You made your assessment, and now it's over. So you could either hire them at three or not hire them at 270. That's a pretty good problem to have, right? But um, anyhow, well, that job's still open. But, I mean, <laughs> but no, seriously though, but level setting that is pretty important. And it might not be as big as numbers as 200 and 300, because like the concept was is that it would have been very hard to justify a 200 to 300. He's probably a 250 candidate in the open market in Manhattan, but you know what? He wanted a little bit more. There was a little bit of a premium on it. He said, look, for me to leave what I need to do, this is the cost of me changing jobs. And you know, he had leverage. And if you have leverage, the better skills that you have, you you know you're you're, you're like ter anybody watch football like you're like Terrell Owens like as long as he's catching touchdown passes and so people put up with all that bullshit, but as soon as he just becomes an aggravation, then they don't want to pay him. They don't want to deal with all that stuff. So that's kind of how you have to look at yourself in some of these processes. Is like you know are you at, are you are you writing checks that your body can cash? That makes sense. So do your homework, get a feel for what you feel your value added is, and know what your bottom line no number is. Also know what your ultimate yes number is, um, and have that range in between. And that range in between could be opportunity to work from home, or an extra week benefit, or whatever. But have a range in mind so that that you're going in with your homework done. I, there's like a general rule that I tell people when you're like early in your career, you should always be taking jobs for opportunity, exposure, and things like that as you get into your career, you know, um, things that are more um, concrete, um, quality of life, money, titles, blah, 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 personal satisfaction, those things should kind of weigh a lot more. But when you're younger, um, I've seen people you know, the right place job early on in the career can accelerate somebody's growth five or ten years in a career. I've seen that through doing this through the course of time. I've seen it, you know, happen. 